there can be only one. This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript The Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in Depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. Working and learn from designers at Amazon and Quora, developers at SoundCloud and Heroku, and entrepreneurs like Patrick Ambron from Brand Yourself. You can level up your design, dev, and promotion skills at Level Up Con, taking place October 8th and 9th in downtown Saratoga Springs, New York. Only two hours by train from New York City, this is the perfect place to enjoy early fall at Oktoberfest while you mingle with industry pioneers in a resort town in upstate New York. Get your ticket today at levelupcon.com. Space is extremely limited for this premium conference experience. Don't delay. Check out levelupcon.com now. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeShip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically. For fuss-free, continuous delivery, check them out at CodeShip.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Component One, makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to Widgmo.com and check them out. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 127 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. Hey there. Dave Smith. Greetings. Jameson Dance. Hello, friends. I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv. And this week, we also have as guests several people from NPM. We have Isaac Schluter. Hello. Ben Co. Yep. Hello. Rebecca, I don't see a last name. Rebecca Turner. Hi. And Forrest. Forrest Norval. That's me. Hey, everybody. All right. Well, you guys want to introduce yourselves really quickly? We've had Isaac on the show, but I don't think we've had everybody else. I'll go first. This is Isaac. You've talked to me before. I am the Isaacs of NPM and Node, so I think probably most people know who I am. I will pass the mic to Ben Co. Hey, I'm Ben Co. as Isaac says, and I am part of the ops team at NPM, and most recently I've been doing a lot of work on our NPM Enterprise, which is our first paid kind of offering that we're putting out. I will go next. I'm Forrest Norville. My official title is Very Good Developer in Charge of the NPM Command Line Interface. And I've been doing a bunch of work for NPM 2, which is going to be released this week. And I will hand off the mic to my esteemed colleague, Rebecca Turner. Hi. Yeah, so I joined NPM very recently to help Forrest out with working on the command line interface. And we've got lots of, you know, a major refactor coming. So excited about that. Really help a lot of the issues we've had. We love people who help issues. Issues! Woohoo! So many issues. Yeah. So many issues. <laughs> so, and- Forrest, I'm just, oh, I just wanted to say I'm excited to know you're a real person and not a red pony because that's I the can only be way both. I've ever interacted with you. <laughs> <laughs> See you on GitHub. Yes. His, his avatar is remarkably, it's a pretty striking resemblance, actually. <laughs> 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 oh. So, NPM2, huh? Oh, yeah. Who wants to know more about NPM2? So the first thing to know about NPM2 is that it actually is not a big, huge deal. I know it's been several years since NPM1 came out, and so it's natural to look at uh, a major version bump as being a fairly, like, striking change. The most important thing to know is that one of the things that we are trying to get right with NPM2 is how we deal with and kind of advocate Semver itself. Uh, there's been some, you know, exciting conversations about Semver recently, but predating all of that, we realized that we were going to make some breaking changes with NPM2, so that justified the major version bump. And we ended up piling about three or four major breaking changes into one release, which we probably will try to avoid in the future. So even though it took several years between NPM1 and NPM2, it's going to be much, much, much faster on the order of probably weeks or maybe months at the outside before we make it to NPM3. What are those major breaking changes? Well, the most significant one is a feature that we added both to support uh, NPM Enterprise and future changes that we're going to make to the registry, which is scoped packages. So in a way similar to the way that you can have repositories scoped to a user or organization on GitHub, we are now offering the ability to uh, scope 
scope the packages to a given organization. And th- I should point out, this actually is only a forward compatible change. This isn't a backwards compatible change. But there are a number of semantics for how it deals with the registry that needs to be supported as well. So, Can, it, I, can it, I stop you for a minute? Sure. So you said that NPM2 is faster than NPM1? I did not say that, I believe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say exactly. that. I'm, I'm an executive now. I can say anything. Yeah, it's it's way faster. It's better. It'll make you more attractive. Uh, so it's actually likely to be slightly slower, but that is because of one of its other very important features, which is that it should be significantly more stable, particularly in a number of use cases when you are driving it from other tools. So one of the kind of uh, big use cases that's relevant to more client-side developers is that there's now there are now quite a few tools that drive uh, npm from the command line interface, uh, and you know that that includes Yeoman, includes the Ember CLI, in certain circumstances it even includes you know Gulp, Grunt, and and Bower. So because those are driving it programmatically, they tend to be pushing everything a lot harder than when you're just using NPM on the command line. And we've run into a whole host of basically synchronization issues, you know, race conditions, deadlocks, locking problems in general. And we put a lot of work into improving that story in NPM2. Again, that's not a backwards compatible change. The, the one change that is breaking backwards compatibility, I will actually allow Ben to speak to because he's the person who actually added that feature. You want to pick that up, Ben? Yeah, sure. So we've been working a lot with uh, MPME, trying to make it easier to just manage scripts with MPM. So basically, we've written this little tool called NDM, which generates upstart scripts for various operating systems from your package.json. And one of the main improvements we needed to make this easier was to be able to pass arguments into uh, your script stanza inside NPM. Uh, before this, you could have, you know, a test stanza inside scripts, but there was no way to pass any arguments to it. So the actual breaking change is that you can now, you know, if you're using something like lab, you can pass the grep flag into it and actually run a specific test. Unfortunately, due to the way our CLI parsing worked, this caused a breaking change. But it, it gives the script take a lot more power power in NPM, which is cool. Very awesome. cool. So hey, um, just ahead. really quick, I think it might be useful for people out there that aren't necessarily very familiar with Semver to have somebody explain Semver, since that was kind of the whole point behind making this 2.0, right? I, controversy. I controversy. Yes, controversial. <laughs> uh, I didn't think it would be, but it is. <laughs> you know, it's any place humans and computers interact with other humans and computers, It's there's bound to be controversy. So basically, Semver is sort of a distillation of some relatively general best practices and common expectations. The way that that ended up kind of culminating in a specification, which which I think like historically was one of the best things to happen to software versioning in a really long time, and I appreciate this occurring, Tom Preston Warner of GitHub wrote up a more or less a manifesto, and then over time that got sort of hammered the 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 raw stuff of that manifesto ended up getting hammered into a, an actual specification with musts and shoulds and mays and stuff. And so uh, NPM was actually a one of the first package systems, package ecosystems, that came to be around the time that Sember was starting to be a popular thing. So the basic idea of Sember is every time that you, you have, your version is a three tuple of numbers. So it's major version, minor version, and patch version separated by periods. You bump the major version every time there's a breaking change. You bump the minor version every time there's an additive change. And you bump the patch version for changes that fix things without changing the API. So the basic idea there is that you can guarantee, like, okay, if if I need something that was added in 1.4, then I should be able to work with 1.5, but 2.0 might break me. So in order to upgrade from 1.4 to 2.0, I need to, you know, do some extra work. And if I've tested with 1.4.5, well, 144 might have a bug, you know, so I, I want to require at least 145. That's the one I've tested with. Now, on top of that, there's all kinds of other junk. Like, how do we handle 0.x.y versions? How do we handle 0.0.x versions? How do we handle versions that have what's called a pre-release flag? So you can do something like 2.1.2-alpha. And then that dash alpha says yeah, this is probably going to be what goes out in that version, but it's not quite ready. So play with it, give me feedback, but it might be broken. And so there's been quite a bit of discussion and back and forth on that. I wrote the module Node Semver, which is the main thing that people use, certainly the thing that NPM uses for parsing version numbers. 
And so Node Semver has been bumped up to, and Node Semver adds the concept of ranges, which are not actually specified in the, in the semver.org specification, but are really crucial to how people use NPM and use versions and, and dependencies in NPM. One of the points of controversy there is the caret operator, which is like, you know, shift number six, the little hat on a US keyboard. And what that means is if I, if I do caret 1.2.3, that means go ahead and allow any additive or patch changes starting from version 1.2.3. According to, and then this gets kind of confusing when it's something like 0.1.2, should I be allowed to do, to pull in 0.2.3 or no? Or should I be allowed to pull in 0.1.3 or no? So, On one side of the spectrum, you have people who say, like the spec says, actually, any version that starts with a zero is no holds barred, anything goes, non-semantic versioning. So between 0.17 and 0.18, you can completely rewrite the API. On the other side of things, you have people who say, you know, zero shouldn't be magical. The major version and 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 the minor version and the patch version mean what they mean, and it should just always be the same. So between 0.0.2 and 0.0.3, you should only be able to add patch changes. And then there's kind of this middle ground, which is the leftmost non-zero number is the major version, and then the next number is the minor version, and the next number is the patch version. So 0.1.2 is kind of like major version 1, minor version 2. So between 0.1.2 and 0.2.0, you can have breaking changes. And between 0.1.2 and 0.1.3, you can have additive changes. So we introduced this caret operator to kind of behave according to that middle ground. And in Semver 3.0, so it was kind of brought to our attention, like, you know, your docs say that you that the caret operator is follow the spec. But it actually doesn't follow the spec because 0.x versions are not tied to a particular release. They're allowed to upgrade. So... We said, okay, that's, you know, that's a kind of interesting, that's a fair complaint. So it's a breaking change in Node Semver to make that change. So let's, you know, bump it from Semver 2 to Semver 3 and try and land that in NPM. What we found almost immediately is that that just is terrible. <laughs> there's, there's a huge number of people who are using, you know, for example, in Gulp, or sorry, in, uh, in Grunt. Gulp is at a pretty high major version by now, I believe. But in, in Grunt, there's a lot of people who use the 0.4.4 and 0.4.5 and are also using peer dependencies quite a bit. So what you have is a situation where if one grunt plugin depends on caret 0.4.5 and another grunt plugin depends on caret 0.4.4, then because they're using a peer dependency on grunt, they would both collide with one another and then this caused all kinds of havoc. So we, we rolled that back in Zember 4. Another thing that had been a long-standing point of kind of contention and confusion is that if I publish a pre-release version of something, like, for example, 2.0.0-alpha.1 or something, then that will be used as a, you know, according to the Semver spec, that is less than 2.0.0 because it's like a pre-release, right? So it's earlier. But it's also greater than 1.0.0. So if I had a version range like greater than or equal to 1.0.0, less than 2.0.0, right? Let's say the 2.0 is going to break me. Well, that would actually pull in the pre-release because it's less than 2.0.0. And there's a bunch of other cases where, you know, even a pre-release of a version that I might be able to do, the pre-release itself might break me. So I want to make sure I don't pull in those betas without having some understanding of it. And so that's why, anyway, long story short, in Semver 4.0, pre-release versions don't match ranges unless you explicitly say, you know, greater than or equal to 123-alpha, then we'll say, okay, we allow pre-release versions on that one particular tuple, but 150-alpha won't match that ever. Long story short, it's all documented in the node Semver package, and so that's where people should go to see how Semver works in NPM. So which version of Semver does node Semver use? That's so meta. Um, I know. <laughs> when it comes to the specification versions, it's going based on the Semver 2.0.0 specification, which is the current one on semver.org. How many Semver specifications are there? Uh, Well, there was a Semver 1.0 spec and then a Semver 2 spec. There's actually a few more versions than that if you go to semver.org. But they were mostly, yeah, that's right, they were release candidates for uh, 2.0.0, which means that according to node Semver 4, those would not have showed up as acceptable matches for anything trying to match on (laughs) (laughs) 2.0.0. I mean... I've talked to Tom myself about this, and like it was always meant by him just to be fairly loose guidelines. So I think the fact that people are arguing so much about the specifics is kind of interesting. That is, is a really good way to put it. Yeah. 
I, I think it's very clear, like, if you look at the history of this and how it ended up coming to be a spec and how much people have gotten very extremely opinionated about it, I mean, myself included, I think that Tom had, I don't want to say ridiculously unrealistic, but mildly fantastical ideas about how easily people would get along with one another. You know, this is kind of the point where it's it's the point of interface, right? It's the friction point, and so it's going to kind of draw a lot of that conflict and controversy. So is the takeaway to never have a zero dot whatever of any product you make? Yes, that is absolutely the takeaway. <laughs> well, all right, so that's a, you know, that's a, a glib answer. The, the real answer is that you are free to use 0.x.y versions for projects that you feel aren't quite ready to go yet. I will say that the NPM community's understanding of what that means is probably not exactly in sync with the kind of reality portrayed by the Semver standard. We had a long conversation about this because we actually did make an effort to, to change the spec to match our understanding of it. And really, I think where that ended up was the NPM kind of looked at the world and we looked at how other communities are doing this and all of the communities using Semver deviate from it in ways large and small. And as a person who is ultimately answerable to the community of users to NPM, like I was just like, I have to be pragmatic about this, right? Like I need to make sure that I am not breaking the community and causing everybody who's actually using peer dependencies for plugin ecosystems like Grunts to have to like chase down all of the developers who've ever written plugins that use the carrot operator and get them to change that so that people can still follow their workflows. Like I, I don't think it's reasonable to put the cost for that on the end users of the of the product. So, like, the argument to pragmatism was just like, let us try as much as possible to make Node Semver work the way that our community expects it to and be more descriptive rather than prescriptive or normative. You know, rather than saying, you have to do this if you want to be playing in the NPM pool, we instead say, let's just kind of, you know, redraw the, the lines of what the pool is to make things keep working while at the same time sort of gently shepherding people onto, onto the path. And, and really, Semver 4 still has uh, an issue, which is that all of those restrictions around pre-release versions mean that people who are trying to couple version numbers, we've seen this already with Phantom JS and a couple other packages where it's like they've got one version number for the package dash and then the you know version number for the upstream package. They may not actually have a non-pre-release version in the NPM registry. So we still have to do some evangelization to uh, people who are maintaining some of these packages and be like, hey, people use your package. That's awesome. But the new version of NPM is out and it's going to cause all of the stuff to break for people who are depending on your package. Can we get you to publish a version of it that's not pre-release. So, like, pretty much everything you do with an ecosystem is as large and complex and freighted with historical baggage as NPMs. Like, there's just no way to do anything without moving somebody's cheese. But really, the goal of all this was to kind of try and square up existing practice with what we consider to be a fairly rough idea of best practices. So that gets at a larger issue, which is when you have, this applies to everyone, not just NPM, when you have an existing user base using your service, how do you balance breaking things for some people versus making things better for everyone? I believe, and I think Isaac will back me up on this, that that is a judgment call. You have to have a fairly good idea of what the community's practices are when possible. Like, you know, this is kind of a, a tenet of product management. You have to drive things to numbers, right? Like you have to be able to say, well, you know, when we look at all of the packages on the registry and we look at all the version numbers they're using and all the version numbers that they're depending on, we can see that this is kind of like the predominant pattern. And then that ultimately feeds into what are going to be subjective judgment calls, right? Like you basically have to be able to justify what you're doing to your user community. And if when you work on NPM, and I think this is probably true for most of the really popular package managers, I'm sure it's true for Bundler, uh, I'm sure it's true for PyPy as well, you have immediate and dramatic feedback from your user base when you do something that, that is either surprising or unpleasant to them. You know, the my beta noir is the NPM issue tracker. Uh, last night, I was totally excited because the, a bunch of the reliability fixes in NPM to allow me to go and just close out a huge swath of bugs. And I was just so excited when I went to bed last night because I'd managed to get the number of open issues on the issue tracker under 1,100. 
Like I got the 1099. I'm like, this has been a good day. I'm going to bed. So like <laughs> that is like you get voluminous, detailed, extremely finicky feedback from people. So you have to have solid answers. And so you have to be able to say, yes, this is worth the pain that I am causing you as an end user of my product and your, you know, dependents and the, the people who are in your community. And because, you know, we are working on this as an open source product, because we are enmeshed within this very active community, you know, which is the larger node ecosystem. And because people are completely unafraid to just kind of like reach out and grab us on IRC and on Twitter and on GitHub itself. That means that we get a, a level and a volume of product feedback that I think a lot of like closed source companies would kill to get. And occasionally we're going to have to do things that are going to just like unavoidably are just going to completely cause really major pain for people. And at that point, it's just like, you know, we got to do it. Sometimes we have to make these changes to make for a better user experience for everybody. And in my experience, while people will grumble about it sometimes for years afterwards, for the most part, people are just like, okay, that makes sense. Like, as long as you have an explanation that's not just, oh, well, because I thought it should work that way. That makes sense. Also, that sounds like how most politicians work. (laughs) <laughs> I like I, I spend a lot of time when I'm talking to people who are getting involved in open source politics, uh, not politics, but just open source in general, telling them to <laughs> think about. Well, that's the yeah. thing. Like, like it is political, right? Ultimately, like when you look at how uh, a, a large and popular project goes, when I'm talking to people and they're coming to me with something that they want to see added to. NPM, I'm like, okay, so I'm not going to say yes or no to that, but you have to make a case to me for this. And like, can we pilot this outside of NPM itself or do we need to do it in the code base? And basically, like, this is not an idea that I came up with on my own. This is actually something that I learned when I was reading about the history of the New Deal. Like, FDR was like, you know, he was elected under the, under the promise that he was going to do all of these progressive things. And then he got into office and he was suddenly the chief executive for the United States. And it, it didn't matter that he was the president if he couldn't get stuff through Congress. So basically he had to say to his constituency, hey, you want to see these things happen. You need to convince your representatives. You need to convince me. You need to make a case for it. And that is very true also of open source. Like, we can wield power as maintainers of these projects. You know, as the leaders of NPM, we have a lot of power as leaders of Node. But, like, that power only exists as long as we have the faith and trust of our user base. And so, really, what we need to be doing is to be acting transparently and accountably enough that people continue to believe that we have their best interests at heart so they don't, you know, they can go fork it. It's open source. You can build your own version. You can, there are probably five or six forks of NPM out there and there are several different registry code bases out there as well. Like our power like results ultimately from the fact that we have the best product, we have the best product because ultimately we have the faith and trust of the user community and we have that because we have earned it. It is easily lost and it's hard to build, but it ultimately is a political process. All right. I want to change topics a little bit. You know, you mentioned briefly some of the new features that were coming in NPM. Can we talk a little bit more about that? For example, scope packages is one that was on the list. Yeah, sure. So when we started this company, actually, I mean, this goes back quite a while, like Part of the reason for deciding to do a startup around NPM was that there were a bunch of features that that companies and you know enterprise users of NPM were desperately asking for. And I mean, when you have a situation where somebody's like pounding on your door with fistfuls of money, you kind of want to like figure out how to let them in, right? So the thing that most people really want is they want to be able to use and, and what they want to pay for, which is also important, is that they want to be able to use NPM to manage private code. And so if we want to have the NPM registry be sustainable, it has to kind of pay its own way. And one way to do that is to figure out how to deliver on this solution, uh, a solution for managing my company's private code using the same techniques and systems that developers are using for public open source NPM code. So the way that we kind of thought through how to do this, so if you just have a private registry that's running a local registry or a private registry that's kind of running in your data center or not or elsewhere, you're inevitably going to run into situations where you have a package name that conflicts with something in the upstream public registry. And it's not that somebody did this to try and screw you over. They didn't know that you published something private. That's how private works. But you can get into a situation where, like, just to pick one random example, let's say I have something privately that's called connect. And then I decide later, like, oh, I want to start using Express on this new web app. Well, Express depends on a module called Connect. But instead of pulling down the public registry's Connect module, it's going to pull down my private 
connect thing, which is something completely different, and then that's not going to work, obviously. So the typical way to work around this is to invent a bunch of like crazy namespace stuff and put you know hyphens in front of everything, and it's kind of clumsy and a little bit weird. So what we kind of thought through how to do, and if, if we're going to have eventually private modules that are hosted by us, that are in the public registry, then we need to have a way to keep them somewhat hidden and also keep them from colliding with anything else. So we came up with this idea of namespacing based on a scope. A scope is basically an at sign and then a name and a forward slash. What that does is by having like at my company slash foo as the module name, I still can type npm install at myco slash foo and it'll work on the command line. I can put it in a package.json. So I depend on at myco slash foo of version one, two, three, semver, c, previous drama. And then we can also have that as the URL on the registry. And then because the at sign and the forward slash are not currently allowed, there's no way that that's going to collide with anything in a backwards incompatible way. And it gives us kind of a hook to start saying, okay, everything that's under this namespace is owned by this group and they have control over it. Now, additionally, if we want to support an NPM enterprise registry, a registry that's actually running inside your local environment, we can say anything that is at my co namespace, anything on that scope is going to be pulled from and published to this internal registry. And so what that gives us is we have two registries. One is the, you know, just the public registry that everybody knows and loves, registry.npmjs.org. And then the other one would be like, you know, registry.mycompany.local. And so I could type on the command line, npm login, dash dash, registry equals mycompany.com, dash dash, scope equals at myco. And now from that point forward, uh, right, I supply my login credentials for my enterprise registry. And from that point forward, everything that I'm doing on that scope is going to the internal registry. And everything that I'm doing that's not on that scope is going to the public registry. So I can be developing on open source code at my company. Like, you know, for example, there's a lot of uh, PayPal has Kraken and Walmart has Happy. There's a bunch of these companies which are getting involved in open source in a real way. But they still have private stuff that they want to keep kind of behind the firewall and behind that curtain. And so developers can very seamlessly just switch from one project to another without having to, you know, juggle RC files or do anything, you know, clumsy and crazy. It's just going to automatically send the right things to the right places. And if you try to publish something with at myco slash foo, and let's say you haven't done the login, if you try to publish that to the public registry, it's actually going to fail because we can detect like, hey, this is not allowed, like get out. And so you don't have the risk of accidentally publishing something which is private, which has happened a few times. We usually get a you know, somewhat panicked email from somebody at some company saying, hey, can you please delete all copies of this? So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. You know, you stand it up and you can keep using open source code and you can have all your private code internally. And so that the namespace scoped modules is the way that we've been able to actually deliver on this. In order to justify paying for NPM Enterprise, there's a couple other things. You can actually have it synchronized down a whitelist of modules. So your build script doesn't have to go across the internet in order to pull down code. And you can also verify that things have been vetted, that you know legal and InfoSec have signed off on it or, or whatever the requirements are at different companies. Another big request we were getting from uh, uh, people who are using NPM at their companies in their enterprise apps, but they want to you know, have a little bit more control over how it works. I think it's worth mentioning, too, that this is out the door. You can try this out right now. Anyone can go to npmjs.org slash enterprise and get a free trial to just play around with scoped modules. One thing that I noticed, uh, Ben copied and pasted the NPN login deal. If you have your own registry or, you know, you're going to use another registry, is there any way that you can set that up so that it just automatically does the login stuff or... You know, automatically uses well, your own registry maybe without having to have the scope? You can be logged into multiple registries simultaneously now. The implementation of that basically maps your credentials to the actual registry URL. So once you've logged into a given registry, instead of what you had to do with old versions of NPM where you would log into a registry, do stuff with it, and then log into another. So if you're moving between you know, the main registry and your private registry, you'd have to keep switching off. And there are tools like NPMRC to manage that for you. Instead, now you just go ahead and log into all the different registries that you have credentials on and then go about your business. The extra step that's added on top of that is that you can also, when you're logging in, provide a scope and then any attempts to install packages that are part of that scope will go to that registry by default and will also use that registry's credentials. 
So does this persist past like a reboot? Uh, yeah, you, yes. it, it, it ends up in your NPMRC, and so you only have to do the login step once, and from that point forward, your NPMRC will have that registry associated with the private NPM you're running. And kind of one little interesting behind-the-scenes detail on that is that with NPM Enterprise, we're introducing the notion of token-based authentication. Like previously, you passed your username and your password with every with an, every authenticated call, like publishing or whatever. And now we're just using a token-based auth for all of that stuff, which when we get it rolled out on the primary registry will be you know, much simpler, much more secure than the old way of just having your credentials, Base64, encoded in your configuration file. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. If somebody steals your NPM RC, can they get in? Well, that has always been true, and that will continue to be true until such point as we add the notion of you know token revocation for token-based auth. Okay. Well, ha- having said that, uh, with the way NPM Enterprise works right now, you authenticate through your GitHub Enterprise or your GitHub account. And it, it actually assigns you a token through the GitHub appliance. So you can, if you say had your NPM RC stolen, you could go to your settings in GitHub and revoke the token from the application settings. So if you think your NPM RC has been stolen, there is a way to revoke it, but you do it through GitHub, not through NPM. We're working on adding other auth systems that will you know, enable people using things other than GitHub. In the future, that's just the most common one that we heard from most of the people we were talking about. Okay. So I would like to talk more about the future because even though a lot of these things are new to people, they're, I don't know, I think to us they're, they're kind of feeling like they're already done and, and in the past. So <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, do you want to talk about the changes coming in NPM or the sort of problems that we're trying to address? Sure. The core of this is the multi-stage install project, which is you can see on the issue tracker, it's one of our milestones. And while that's what we've been calling it, it's really a change to anything that mutates the um, node modules folder. And so this is going to be npm install and npm remove and dedupe. And this is, you know, currently it kind of goes through as it goes. It, you know, it's, it's doing it in the most obvious way right now. And the multi-stage install project is going to make it so that it does all the dependency resolution first, and then it does all the downloads, and then it does all of the pre-installs. And by separating these pieces out, it allows us to, well, it removes a lot of the race conditions that we had previously in the code base, and that we've, you know, this is what we were fighting with to get 2.0 out, was to fix a lot of the race conditions that were, frankly, hard to track down because it was so, the old code flow was so, I guess, uh, twisty, so at the same time, this is going to address, we're hoping to address a lot of the issues that people have been having with peer dependencies. And NPM shrink wrap is another major piece of this. Can you talk about both of those and maybe explain what they are? I've heard yeah, a lot yeah. about peer dependencies and I've heard a lot of people complain about them, but sure. I haven't used them very much. So peer dependencies are a little weird because what you say is anything that requires me also requires this other thing. So it's almost a way of injecting a dependency into the thing that uses your module. And so, why so on wouldn't the surface, you just require. I mean, why wouldn't you have that as a regular dependency? So, so on the surface, that sounds a little strange. But this is really important if you're writing. It's used in plugin ecosystems. So if you're using, you know, the most obvious place would be things like Grunt and Gulp. They have large plugin ecosystems. So their plugins go. I don't personally use this module in any way, but in order to use my module, it needs to be a part of this other thing. So, and this is why they don't include that module as a dependency, is because they don't actually directly use that module, but they're only useful in the context of that module. And so they say, well, I designed this plugin to work with the following versions of the core parent module. And and so the peer dependency is a way of specifying that and it's caused problems because, of course, if you're very specific about the versions you work with, it means, oh, well, I've got two plugins on my project, and they want different versions of the parent module, and now everything's going to break. And it's just a confusing like way of thinking. It's a confusing form of dependency compared to all the other dependencies, our child dependencies. 
Well, yeah, like yeah. one of the main goals of NPM is to avoid dependency hell, right? Which is finding yourself right. in a situation where you've depended on things to the extent that the dependency constraints are just not satisfiable and you can't understand why things are broken. And the, one of the main problems with peer dependency is, is that it makes it very easy for you to put yourself back into dependency hell. So like above and beyond the work that Rebecca is doing to create the multi-stage install process, we also have kind of another item on our, our longer-term roadmap to basically nerf the way peer dependencies work. Like, we're going to make them do less stuff, and we're going to make them be more explicit about what they are doing. Anyway, back to you, Rebecca. Yeah, so peer dependency is the one piece. Shrink wrap is another sticking point that we've had. And shrink wrap is a way of specifying, well, I know that my mod, you know, the modules all have their version ranges that they allow. Shrink wrap is allow a way of saying, well, we have locally tested with specific versions of each of these modules. So we only want to use those versions. And it's essentially a way of snapshotting your node modules folder without actually taking a copy of it. It just copies down the versions of everything that you have installed. And the way it works right now is sometimes confusing. There are some corner cases, like if I type in npm install in a module name, that happens to be in shrink wrap, I'll only get the version that's in shrink wrap. And it's not always clear that that can be confusing because normally you type npm install in a module name and you get the most recent version of that module. Some of this is just going to be better messaging. So improving npm to give it more feedback when it does things that might be unexpected. Or like, I'm installing this older version because you told me to. One of the intents of shrink wrap is to make it so that well, I can, in my module, I can say I want specific versions of my direct dependencies, but I can't require specific versions of all of their dependencies. And NPM shrink wrap gives you a way of doing that because you can say, if you see this module, this is the only version allowed. So our hope is that by like centralizing the version or the module resolution and dependency resolution into a single piece that happens separate from everything else, we'll be able to make the interactions between shrink wrap and the other pieces more clear. And finally, there's a dedupe, which just looks for modules that could be removed. Because, you know, if you've got two dependencies that both include another, another module of the same version, why would you want two copies of it installed? They could be moved up to the top level. And this can sometimes produce um, non-intuitive results, like if you can end up with older versions than you might expect because, well, one module requires this older version and the other module can, can use the older version, but ordinarily we get a newer one. And so now it's working with an older one that it, than you had originally considered. But if everyone's following Simver, this works great. One other thing I wanted to kind of point out about that yeah. is that once we have this stuff more straightened out, that allows us to, like, we have been recommending that people use shrink wrap for making reproducible builds so that when you deploy, you shrink wrap your application before you deploy, and then you know exactly what versions of things are going to be installed. That's in theory. In practice, it actually hasn't worked out that way, in large part because the install algorithm has been non-deterministic because it's kind of been like following the state machine all over the place. The work that Rebecca's doing, by consolidating all that stuff, separating it into separate phases, one of the main major goals for this is to make sure that we have completely repeatable builds. And by that, I mean when I start from one version of my application with one set of dependencies installed and then run npm install and get a bunch of stuff installed and create a shrink wrap file, check that in and then you check it out and run npm install based on that shrink wrap file, you will end up with the exact same versions of everything installed in your application that the first person did when they started. That's been the kind of the hope for it all along, but it actually doesn't work out that way in practice for a bunch of the reasons that are basically just related to how the actual install algorithm works today. Right, right. And there are like a host of corner cases that people run into where they're surprised by the outcome of like dedupe doesn't include development dependencies when it's deduping. And there are arguments for this and against this, but it's we need better messaging around these things. And so that's other pieces we hope to include there. That's very cool. I'm really excited to see uh, some of these go into effect. I mean, the, the dedupe is definitely handy and, you know, just some of these other cool features. Are there any other things that we can talk about? We're getting kind of toward the end of our hour here. Just to add with dedupe, the plan there is to actually fold that functionality into install. And so that will no longer have to be something that's done separately. 
Oh, nice. One of the issues that people have is like there are a large number of people out there who would really like uh, npm basically to work exactly the same as uh, Bundler, right? Like they they want to be able to check in their they will, they basically want to be able to go and install something, do things, and then they're going to get like an artifact like npm shrink wrap. That Jason, but in the case of Bundler, that would be the gem file that lock that gets updated automatically when they do everything, and then the ground truth becomes that lock file that's always updated whenever you do anything to change the status of your application. That's pretty different than how NPM has grown and how the ecosystem, a large chunk of the community around it, thinks about it. But we do want to make it that a more explicitly supported and smoother use case. So like one of the major outcomes of this, if we get everything right, is that you can make it, just, just generally make it a lot easier to you know support this as a primary way for you to package and distribute your applications and to develop in such a way that you don't actually have to be as mindful of the fact that you're interacting with with a shrink wrap file or deduping things or whatever. And it also, the dedupe piece will pay dividends for one of our you know, like chronic support problems, which is Windows, which we could probably spend a whole hour talking about all on its own. <laughs> but if we are deduping by default and we're always trying to create as dependency tree as we can, it does lessen the kind of thorny edges of working with Windows to a certain degree. Before we run out of time, we're currently uh, two people who are also uh, NPM employees are traveling across Europe for conferences and vacations and such, but we are renovating the website pretty dramatically. This is going to include some pretty handy additions for finding modules and kind of putting modules into groups called collections and ecosystems. And so there's actually a pretty interesting set of ecosystems that are already kind of gathering modules into groups today. There's stuff like Browserify or, you know, you could look at all of the ecosystem of Grunt plugins or all the things that work on Windows or all the things that work on Azure and so on. One of the first of these is a collection of all the modules that are kind of designed to work with Salesforce APIs. And so they're they're actually doing a have a blog that's going to be going live relatively soon on uh, developer.salesforce.com slash blogs, and that'll be uh, talking about NPM and how to connect it with Salesforce and stuff. So there's some pretty interesting like stuff that's going to be happening on the website, and there's also going to be some ways for individual developers to say, here's a collection of stuff that I use to you know do a login flow, right? So something that's kind of outside the scope of a single module, which would be more like a blog post or a collection of things, they could say, you know, I'm using these two Express plugins, and here's how I connect them, and then I'm talking to Redis, and here's how I'm doing that. But uh, anyway, yeah, so the, the, the exciting thing about that is being able to tie a package page back to an actual using, like, usage example of this thing and have people be able to you know, share how they're using modules together and which modules they're using together and which ones kind of complement one another well. Cool. That sounds really cool. And and I like how it's tied to a specific use case. I mean, the Salesforce example is very, I, I think, appropriate to that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're you know they have a bunch of web APIs, and a lot of people are using Node modules with them. But it's not very clear, you know, like what's the one I use for doing this one particular task? Like you're going to find kind of very small modules that address very discrete individual subtasks of that, which is good, but it requires a lot of thoughtfulness on the part of the user. So just jumping in and getting started for new people is very difficult still. Yeah. One thing I'd like to reiterate, if you want to get a feel for scoped modules before they're in the public registry, which is going to be a little ways out, just npm install npm e on any CentOS or Ubuntu trusty machine, and you can start playing with scoped modules. Cool. That's super rad. Yeah. All right. Should we do some picks? Absolutely. All right. Dave, do you want to start us with the picks? Sure. So uh, is it appropriate to pick... Other podcasts? Yes. So one I've been really enjoying lately, if you're a bit of a history geek, is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. He goes into some really cool detail about some human conflicts over the course of history. Really personal touch, and I really enjoy it. Nice. Jameson, what are your picks? I have three picks. The first pick is a talk by Brad Boos. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. He spoke at JSConf U a week or two ago about uh, creating art and kind of experimenting with things that aren't trying to build useful products for people. And that's something that really appeals to me, just the, the joy of creating for creation's sake. His slides are one of my picks. The next pick is a little NPM module called Boyd's, which is for 
doing a flocking simulations. So it's when you have this group of entities and they kind of follow each other around via a few really simple rules. It's kind of some really, really simple artificial intelligence or, or like, I don't know what the other word for it is. Anyways, it was cool that there was an NPM module for that. It was very helpful. And then my last one is a site called 5013.es, which is a bunch of side projects by someone. I think her name is Super Sole on Twitter. I don't know, but it's a bunch of like art and music and WebGL code experiments. And they're all uh, pretty fun to play with and inspiring. Those are my picks. Cool. Joe, what are your picks? All right, so uh, I got three picks today. My first one is a really cool, I guess it's you call it a video game. It's called Jaxie the Robot, but it's actually an educational game used to teach kids how to program in JavaScript. And it's done with a game where you have you control this robot, and in order to get the robot, it's kind of a platformer type game. If you want to get him to move around in the world and get farther in the game, you have to write JavaScript in order to get him to do that sort of stuff. And it teaches kids how to code in JavaScript using a game, which I thought was incredibly, incredibly clever. And you can support him on Kickstarter, and it's just at jacksytherobot.com. Then my second pick is going to be a, a CSS approach that was developed by a friend of mine, Dave Geddes. It's called CSS Style, where the second S in CSS is the first S in style. It's just at csstyle.io, and it's clean and simple styling for the web. He did a presentation on it at a previous user group, and it was really, really cool and a great way to clean up your CSS. And it was it's kind of aimed at developers, people that aren't necessarily experts in CSS. So if you're a developer but you don't consider yourself to be awesome at CSS, it's a great sort of uh, framework to look at. And then lastly, I'm going to pick uh, Maroon 5's new album. I'm not sure if it's called V or 5. It's the letter V. I'm not sure if you call it V or 5, but it, their new album is actually pretty cool. A lot of good music. So that'll be my final pick. Awesome. I just have one pick this week, and that is Boomerang. It's a plugin for Gmail, and I've just found it to be really handy. Uh, if you don't know, I'm a freelancer. Hire me. Thanks. So for follow-ups, I've just not been super good at follow-ups, and my secret is Boomerang now. And basically what it is is it's a way of having conversations in Gmail brought back to your inbox. So, for example, I'll email somebody and say, hey, do you want to, you know, talk on Skype or grab lunch? And they'll they'll email me back and they'll say, well, I'm busy for the next two weeks, but can you check with me then? And I say yes. And then I tell Boomerang to bring it back to my inbox in two weeks. Or some of the folks I email sometimes get busy. And so I'll send them an email and I'm pretty sure they got it, but they don't respond. And so I'll just set it to bring it to back to my inbox in a week if I don't hear from them. And then I can email them back and say, hey, I bet you got busy. You know, I was hoping we could talk about whatever. And works out really nicely. So uh, those are my picks. Isaac, what are your picks? I'm actually curious about Boomerang. How does that compare with follow-up then? Like followup.cc? No. So there's a service out there. It's at followup.cc that I've looked at before. And that one, you actually forward the email to them like two days from now or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And follow up then is, is similar. Follow up then.com. Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing if you email it to them and then they send it back. Uh, yeah, Boomerang is yeah. actually a plugin in Gmail. And oh. since I use the web interface, um, I, I just, as part of the form that I'm filling in, I just tell it when I want to be reminded to check up on it. I see. That's it, great. It's it's right there in the interface and then it just puts a it puts a tag on it for boomerang and then yeah, it keeps track and tells it to come back. If you've set it to boomerang too, it also has a little part of the UI that if you open up an email that has that's set to be scheduled to come back, it'll tell you when it's scheduled to come back. So if if you're going through your email and stuff, then it'll, you know, it'll show you that too. So anyway, I love it. Okay, cool. I just fixed my mic, and I'm not going to move, and I'm going to try and do these picks. So I have three picks. The first is a book called Ancillary Justice by Anne Lecky, which is fantastic and everybody needs to read. The second is a uh, another podcast that I've been continuing to enjoy. I don't know if I meant... I don't think I mentioned it last time I was on JavaScript Jabber, but... Um, it's called Roderick on the Line. It's helping a lot of people. It's one of those podcasts you really need to start from the beginning. And if you don't like it by the fifth or sixth episode, you should probably um, reevaluate your life. And um, the third pick is actually an anti-pick. I'm going to unpick U2's new album. 
and uh, <laughs> give you and provide a link that will actually remove it from your account, which is fantastic. <laughs> Literally, awesome. the only part of that that came through is the end. <laughs> oh, I, I heard the whole thing. Yeah, me too. Oh. Yeah, Forrest, maybe the problem is your, your <laughs> speaker is not my microphone. Spreading. Dang, getting gaslighted by CEO. You know, I, I got pretty <laughs> used. When I was an employee, I got pretty used to tuning out my boss, too. So Fair enough. <laughs> you too. Removal tool. That's funny. So it's not even worth what you paid for it. Is that what you're saying, Any, Isaac? I'm saying anything free is a ripoff. Uh, <laughs> nice. That's a good life tip. Uh, Rebecca, what are your picks? I'm going to pick two parser projects. There's a Nearly on NPM, which is a implementation of the early parsing algorithm in JavaScript. And this allows you to parse anything DNF can express. And it's super fast and it provides much better diagnostics than other more popular parsing algorithms. And uh, similarly, there's MARPA, which is probably the most refined implementation of early parsing. And this is something that came out of the Perl community and nearly has, has been in the process of being updated to include the refinements that MARPA has done. But for people who are interested in parsers, even if you're not interested in Perl, MARPA is well worth reading into because they've done a lot of really cool stuff. It's unbelievably fast and the diagnostics it gives you are, you know, it can actually tell you what's wrong, which, you know, if you've ever written a yak based grammar, you're like, you know, that's just unheard of. Those are my picks. Very cool. Ben, what are your picks? So first off, uh, Forrest, Michael Rogers, and myself and a few other Oakland Node people are putting together an event called DanceJS, which is going to be a bunch of tech talks about hacking music and also followed up by a dance party. It's uh, information is at dancejs.io, and it's going to be on October 4th, so I just wanted to put a plug in for that. My next pick is a library I've been using a ton lately with all the CLI stuff I've been writing. It is called Inquirer, and it's just a great tool for uh, reading in command line arguments in Node. I guess the third thing I'll plug will be my own library, NDM, which we've been using for Enterprise a ton, which is just a way to create run scripts on various operating systems for long-lived processes. Cool. So is it kind of a daemon library or something? Yeah, it's, it's similar to uh, Foreman, but has more features than Foreman and has been kind of built up around NPM Enterprise. That's really cool. Forrest, what are your picks? I have two. The first is Edna Piranha's Revisit Link. If you don't know who Edna Piranha is, well, first, you got to get on my level here. But second, she is the woman who is responsible, along with Soledad Pinades, who you already mentioned, that's uh, Super Soul, for making Meet Spaces, the animated GIF-based chat network. Uh, and Revisit is her next kind of evolution of a lot of the ideas behind Meet Spaces. It's a set of simple API restrictions for building API services that basically let you glitch images and audio and other things where you can write some sort of like stream transform and produce something and it's a way to get people who are maybe more creatively inclined than hardcore coders into writing simple web services in kind of a modern style and it has produced just an endless stream of completely bizarre animated GIFs and you know vaporwave designs and all kinds of like crazy culture. Everything that is weird and awesome on the internet seems to kind of be tied to Edna Prana in some way. My other pick is I've been completely obsessed with Tanaki Hisikotsu's blogging about the Civil War. Uh, he's a blogger about a lot of uh, like contemporary issues for the Atlantic and wrote a pretty highly regarded article of making the case for reparations at the beginning of the summer, but he's been very much completely obsessed with the history of the Civil War, making the, the history of the Civil War or like more relevant and direct for uh, African American audiences, trying to kind of look at it as an actual phenomenon, look at it how it ties to Reconstruction, just a ton of stuff. It's gotten me like reading like huge stacks of like Lizzie's Grant's memoirs and James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom, and a guy has gone through and compiled a list of all of his writing about the Civil War on his own blog. I dropped the link to it in the notes. And it's uh, more than you can read in a week, and it's just fantastically inter interesting, and there's a really lively commentary community about it, this thing called the 
a feet liberal book club grew up around it, and that's been actually absorbing pretty much all of the time that I am not spending obsessing about NPM. Very cool. Well, thanks again for coming, guys, especially on the short notice, but there's just really interesting stuff coming through. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All yeah, right. This was great. Well, uh, we will catch up with you all later. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank to, you. Thanks to our listeners. We'll catch you all next week. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. This episode is sponsored by Raygon.io. If at any point your application is crashing, what would that cost you? Lost users, customers, revenue? Raygun is an essential tool for every developer. Raygun takes minutes to integrate and you'll be notified of your software bugs as they happen with automatic notifications, a full stack trace to detect, diagnose, and fix errors in record time. Raygun works with all major mobile and web programming languages in a matter of minutes. Try it for free today at raygun.io. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you wish you could be part of the discussion on JavaScript Jabber? Do you have a burning question for one of our guests? Now you can join the action at our membership forum. You can sign up at javascriptjabber.com slash jabber, and there you can join discussions with the regular panelists and our guests. 